It's uh, March 21st, 2046. All right, I guess uh, just start with your name, I guess. Okay, uh, I'm Jeffrey Keene. And uh, what colony? WDC. All right, uh, tell me about it. Well, I guess uh, I could start when we discovered it. I was a graduate student uh, doing an internship at what used to be NASA in what used to be Washington, D.C. Our, our mentor was showing us how to identify various space objects in telescopes, such as planets, comets, meteors, and asteroids. He was about to let us look at telescope pictures of these when an engineer came up and whispered something in his ear. And I'll never forget the look on his face. He went white as a sheet. You informed him about Titus. Right, Titus. Uh, what did your mentor do after that? Well, he tried to continue on, but we could all tell he was struggling to keep his composure. And that's when he led us over to a telescope, uh, the one tracking these celestial bodies. And on the screen, we could see it, Titus. Doctor, can you help explain for the listeners the mechanics of an asteroid? Okay, well, an asteroid is a small rocky body orbiting the sun, and there are a whole bunch of these ranging in size from nearly 600 miles across to just dust particles. And they're found between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, though some have more eccentric orbits. Let's see, an asteroid the size of a house traveling at, say, 30,000 miles an hour would have enough energy roughly equal to the bomb that fell on Hiroshima. That's about 20 kilotons. An asteroid like this would flatten reinforced concrete buildings up to half a mile from ground zero, wooden buildings up to a mile and a half from ground zero. It would, in other words, do extensive damage to any city. That doesn't sound too bad. Uh, what about bigger? Uh, an asteroid, say, half a mile wide would be the equivalent of 100 billion tons of TNT. And Titus was five miles wide. The asteroid that killed the dinosaurs was seven miles. Uh, tell us more about that day at NASA. What happened? What was the procedure? Well, um, see, when our mentor informed us about Titus, the immediate response was, how? How could something this size go unnoticed? NASA had been tracking Titus for years, and the conclusion had been that it would pass by the Earth. But something happened. Something in space had knocked it into the Earth's orbit. And once an asteroid gets pulled into a planet's orbit, there's no stopping it. The impact with the Earth's crust is the only thing that will finally stop it. The energy of the impact will vaporize the asteroid and a large amount of the Earth's crust, creating a crater more than 100 kilometers across, throwing any and all debris into the air. That day, Doctor. I'm sorry. Shooting it with a nuclear missile or laser was out of the question. Scientists at NASA predicted a six-month timeline. The White House was notified. An emergency broadcast was scheduled for 7 p.m. that evening, set to show around the entire world. You'll never know. You'll never know the sick feeling in my stomach that entire day. Walking home, I looked at the people around me. They're all going about their daily lives, not knowing what was, what was about to happen. Everyone's lives would change like that, and nobody could do anything. I felt helpless. The broadcast came on. World leaders united for the first time in history, alerted the world of the news. I remember that day. And then it was like a silence just dropped over the planet. Some swallowed their fear, some had tears in their eyes, some stunned into statues. I remember the public reaction being havoc. A lot of people went crazy, and who can blame them? Riots broke out, there was looting, as everyone rushed to stockpile goods, fires were started up from the rage. Our panic consumed people, fear destroyed people, and it spread like smoke. People said, God's abandoned us, and some said, there is no God. And those who said there was pleaded with people, asking them to turn their hearts toward him before our doom. And some religious groups believed this to be like Armageddon or the apocalypse, and they refused to take part in the mass exodus. Some believed that this was our time to die. I was one of them. 
I didn't think there could be any way to survive this. I felt like I went insane for a while. Didn't leave my apartment, sat around, just waiting to die. But not everyone went crazy, did they? No, no, some were like calm, um, like churches, synagogues, etc. opened their doors and welcomed people in. And I remember I walked into a, a church one evening and it was their last service before they shut their doors forever. And they prayed for something or someone to save them. And maybe it was the atmosphere, I, I don't know, I don't know what happened, but it, all of a sudden I realized I didn't want to die. I wanted to do something to beat this beast from the sky and survive. What was the preparation for Doomsday like? There was a huge stockpile. I was surprised how smoothly and efficiently the former United States government handled it. Washington was a mess. So many people demanded answers. Protesters marched the streets every day. The stockpile movement of 2036 was absolutely massive. Almost everything was under consideration for preservation and storage. Books, films, technology, animals, plants, anything that could potentially be of use if and when the destruction was over, if we survived. Yeah, tell us more about the shelters. Well, every scrap of land was divided up and citizens within the area uh, were instructed to dig a large underground shelter. And each shelter could hold 500 people. The stockpile of food and water was gargantuan. So much food and water stored in each shelter, as well as various other things essential to survive, like generators for electricity and such. I remember helping my district complete our shelter. It was lots of hard work. It must have taken a long time. It took the whole of six months. Lots of people tried to stay positive. Some were absolutely pessimistic, but everyone looked up at the sky with wonder. It didn't seem possible that this small growing ball in the sky could destroy us. Then on October 31st, Halloween, everyone on our lonely planet walked into those shelters and shut and locked the doors behind us. And then? November 3rd, 2036, Titus struck the earth. What's your name? I'm Clara Connors. And uh, how old are you? I'm 19. I was nine when the asteroid struck, though. Oh, so you were quite young. Yes. What do you remember? I remember lots of crying. <laughs> it's a funny thing to remember. It's also sad. It was a sad time. Lots of people didn't think we would survive. So tell me about October 31st of 2036. I remember being woken up that day early. I helped mom and dad clear the rest of the house. You must understand, at that time, I was unaware of what was happening. My parents never told me the whole story. I only remember them telling me that something bad was going to happen and that we need to stay safe. But there was never panic in their voice, no fear. They stayed strong for me. It being Halloween and all, all I wanted to do was go trick-or-treating. But that obviously didn't happen. Instead, we boarded up the windows and doors to the house. I don't know, in case it survived the destruction, I guess. I had this fantasy that we would return and everything would go back to normal. Were you allowed to take anything with you? I was allowed to take some clothes and books, a few toys to play with, and my cat. Not many people were allowed to take their pets. Your dad must have been important for you to take a household pet like that. He was. Political figures were given special privileges when it came to the shelters. My dad was the leader of our colony. Back to October, what did the rest of the day look like? We packed the last of our belongings into our car. And we sat in the driveway for a long time, looking at the house, my parents both crying. When we finally headed off towards the shelter, the amounts of cars parked outside was overwhelming. The entrance to the shelter was huge, a, a huge opening in the ground with giant metal doors five feet thick. 
A large crowd of people were filling in. Lots of people were crying in fear. The door stayed open all day in the event that someone who vowed to die above ground changed their mind. But at midnight, the doors were shut for good, each door requiring 10 men to close it. That must have been something for a child of mine. It was scary. Just the ignorance of not knowing what was happening made it all too much. Everyone sat in the dim, damp earth for the next few days. Barely a word was spoken. It was eerie quiet, as if we were already dead and couldn't speak. We had hung a big calendar on the wall of the shelter with a huge circle drawn around November 3rd, and then it finally arrived. What was it like? Quiet, as everyone held on to each other. But then there was a massive rumbling. The ground shook so violently, everyone screamed, and that's when it hit. The rumbling slowly faded and it grew quiet again. There were whispers of, is it over? Are we safe? It took 10 minutes before the earthquake started. Again, the shelter shook with such a force, this time louder and stronger. Those who weren't there can't possibly imagine what it was like. About another five minutes, the debris began falling. How long did the earthquakes last? It felt like an eternity. The hum hurt everyone's ears and drove people mad. People throwing themselves around, crying and screaming, praying. But it couldn't have lasted more than an hour. About two hours after the impact, the air blast came through. It sounded like a heavy traffic above us, but of course we all knew everything was gone. What were those first moments like after the noise had subsided? No one knew what to do. People actually voted to open the doors and go up but we're outnumbered by the people who knew better. The only thing we knew is that we could settle down and wait for weeks, months, years. What was the time in the shelter like? It was mostly quiet, quiet the first few weeks. No one really engaged or socialized. Everyone was in charge of something, so usually we all minded our own business. The generator had to be charged manually every day. We developed a system, um, a schedule, where everyone would take turns cranking it 10 minutes at a time, a duty to earn your keep. I remember the communal silence was broken a month later. Someone brought along an old record player and some records. I'll never forget the first album they played. Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. The music started and everyone grew quiet. And then they started singing and dancing. Just an impulse within everyone. And that's when we all grew comfortable. We became a real group, a family. What did you do personally to pass the time? I mostly read books. The sleeping area was a large room with thin mattresses laid on the floor. I would lay on mine and read. If I wasn't reading, I would usually help my dad with various jobs, feeding the few animals we had, check on the farm, catalog the food we had left. How did you grow food without sunlight? Our shelter had several grow lights that stood in each corner of the farm room. It was by far the brightest room in the shelter. You already told me that you didn't know exactly what was happening at that age. Were there other kids who were also, pardon the pun, in the dark? Of course. Kids as young as nine months were in the shelter. We were all pretty ignorant when it came to the asteroid. None of the kids knew why their parents made them hide in the ground. There was a constant fighting among us. Some of the younger kids would miss the luxury of life and, you know, complain. <laughs> there must have been fights among the adults as well. Oh, there always was. Not everyone wanted to do their part or conform to the rules. There was a small group who didn't want my dad in charge anymore. 
I remember a nasty confrontation. This man, older than my dad, got right in his face and told him he was a terrible leader. There were a few choice words that were said as well, but it blew over. All the fights did. My dad, despite the growing criticism, was actually a really good leader. He knew what to say to everyone when fights broke out. He reminded us that we had to work together. As far as we knew, we were the last people on earth. We needed to get along for the sake of the human race. Almost everyone still alive today lost someone important when Titus struck. Did you lose anybody? My grandma. She was living in New York when the asteroid hit. The tidal waves hit the East Coast and wiped out all of New York. She refused to join the others in the shelter. My last phone call with her, she said, Honey, I've lived a good life. There is nothing left for me here to explore. It's my time. You survive and go on your own adventures. We'll meet again. Then she hung up. I thought about her a lot while in the shelter. I still do. Sorry to hear that. So the months pass. When did you as a colony decide to finally open the doors? It was two years after the impact. On Christmas Day, it was our Christmas present. We all walked up the tunnel to the doors and there were large dents in them where the debris had hit them. There was dust everywhere on the floor. The same 10 men who had closed the door took their positions again and slowly pulled the doors open. The creak from the hinges was deafening, but as it opened, our first glimpse of sunlight streamed in. Everyone shielded their eyes from the brightness, but not a single person moved. We all stood in our first bath of light and years. But suddenly, a grown man began running towards the exit, and then another did, and another. Soon the whole colony was rushing outside. We were all stunned by what we saw. What did you see? Nothing. There was nothing. Nothing but dust and large chunks of rocks and metal, twisted up cars and buildings. All the houses were gone. Streets, stores, everything. Gone. Some people began to wail at the sight, but the kids, they began running and shouting and laughing, dancing in the dust. After two years of a stuffy shelter, this was paradise. But soon we all realized how cold it was. Even though the sun was shining, we knew we couldn't stay outside for long. We had to go back in. For how long? We didn't know. Excuse me, sir. Hey, can we have an interview, please? Documentation, general interest. Can you tell us your name? I go by Steely Mike. What are you doing out here? I'm a scavenger, I'm a trader. Come follow me, we can talk inside. What is it you do exactly? I scavenge around looking for useful junk, and I trade it for things the colony needs, mostly food. How did that start? Well, my shelter mates and I first came up and saw the destruction. We realized that it was going to be harder to survive than we first thought. We relied on that underground structure for months before we could finally stay above ground. The nearest city with all the steel was blown 20 miles away. We built an above-ground shelter from salvage materials in the ruins. Got ourselves a barn, too, and a food farm. How did you manage that? Our colony saved lots of animals and plants. Kept them underground with us. Lots of seeds, too. Tree seeds, apple seeds. But those animals, tough to move those suckers from down there to up here. But we did it. Built a shelter and kept everyone together. After a few months, a few of us were curious if anyone else had survived. The area was pretty rural before the asteroid, so we guessed that the next shelter was over 50 miles away. It's amazing, one of our guys there was able to build a manual-powered car, almost like a bike, and so me and two others headed off in search of other folks. 
quite ambitious. It must have been tough. You got that right. You wouldn't believe how much the land changed. I knew the area well before the strike, and it is completely different. Hills flattened and valleys smoothed over. It's all so flat. You can walk about 400 miles in five days and still see this shelter in the distance. Scattered around were huge chunks of rocks. Plenty of obstacles, mostly the ruins of what was. And dust everywhere it gets in your hair and in your clothes and in your shoes and even in your mouth. Tell us about the ruined city. The ruins, we called it, is what was left of St. Louis. Most of the buildings have fallen and not much still stands. The gateway arch is gone, mostly the metal skeleton. A few scraps of other materials here and there. Some of the buildings even have basements with lots of supplies and things to trade for. Did you ever find any shelters? We did. It took us a month to find another shelter. Along the way, we kept running into small looting groups. Got stopped a couple of times. They were mainly robbing us for food. We struck a bargain with them. We told them that we had a nice group going a ways back. They were welcome if they didn't cause problems. We pointed them in the right direction and they headed off. I still know them personally today. Eventually though, we found another underground shelter. We could see the twisted steel sticking up out of the sand. And were there people there? It sure was, they had made quite a place for themselves in that shelter. Far as I could tell, they hadn't traveled above ground before we got to them. Me and my buddies got to see them take their first glimpse of the land. We also told them about our group having food and other supplies. Started a trade group with them, the first of many. We kept on pushing through the land, traveling around 200 miles in a month. Made a map along the way, showing all the shelters we found. A total of about 20. We trade with them regularly, have been for about two years now. Sounds like a nice little community. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. We help each other out and invite others to take part. We're all we've got now. Have to rely on each other to survive. It's incredible. Lots of folks are reinventing, trying to get back to the world we knew. Not much technology was saved. We're having to start from scratch. Computers, televisions, electric can openers, we're all starting over, but we aren't the same. I don't think we'll ever be the same. You don't? No, in fact, I think we're better. This whole experience has made us closer as a race. As a species, we're having to rely on one another more now than then. We work together. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live off each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. The living world is not out there somewhere, but in our hearts. This extraordinary time when we are all aware of each other, each of us is as complex and beautiful as all the stars in the universe. We have done great things. Through the greater part of the agony and enduring, through our wrongdoing, through the worst times, through the mayhem that is our history, there is one thing that has sustained our souls and lifted our species over its beginnings, and that is our fearlessness. We deal more kindly with one another and work to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home that we've ever known. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. Uh, uh oh, uh, the battery's about to die. Hang tight. We'll charge okay. it and then continue the. Continue the.